The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm sitting here in the fires, but still at the controls. This is Al Warren, of course, and on the other side of the country, we've got Sparky. Sparky? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a new name for me. Yeah, you look like a Sparky nope, today. You no got your Rose, no Daffy Dave. No, Rose was when, you're, when, when you go to see Frankie Valley with your mother, then it's David Rose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It just doesn't work, you know. Sparky, because you're all happy. You're all excited. Yeah. You're going to take on the world. I think I'm over-caffeinated. I think that's what it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good, good place to be. It really is. Mm. Unless your heart starts pumping out the blood. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, so um, we're continuing this week, and we will not be airing in Phoenix again today. I'm just telling mm. you, uh, <laughs> that's two <laughs> days in a row this week, so they won't hear this. Um, but everybody else, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, we've got another horror, and I don't mean whore, I mean horror. <laughs> and uh, we've got Mr. John F.D. Taff. Hi. Hi, guys. How you doing today? <laughs> well, you know, it's been, a, it's been a weird day. It's been a weird week. You know, um, but good, good. Those are okay. good. Yeah, yeah. But we're good to have. It's we're good to go, and we're good to have you on here. Well, thank um, you. Wow, you've been around, <laughs> and, 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 and I mean that in a good way. Yeah, and you've written a lot too, right? So, uh, no, I just you've got over a hundred short stories and seven novels. It says in the in the bio. Yeah, so, like, I've been, I've what been this for about thirty years now? Yeah, but that's still a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I really, uh, you know, short fiction was the way that I got into all of this, and it really is, you know, my first love in terms of writing still. I still like to to churn out uh, short stories. What is it about the short story? You see, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming from writing true crime and nonfiction and all this mm-hmm. stuff, so I, I you know, I, this is all really bizarre uh, <laughs> for my brain to take in, because he's, you know, a horror writer, it's just a, they're horrible. Like, yeah. they, <laughs> I mean, as a horror, like they're just like I. I don't. I don't get the whole creation process. Like you guys are very, you know, you create your characters, right. and story, and you develop it and do all this stuff. And I see. I go. For, I follow the real stuff. I don't make up what's happening. It's happening. Right. So, uh, is there something about a short story that you like the the finished product better? Yeah. Well, I think that. And you probably heard this from other writers that that uh, a short story is 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 harder. Uh, doing a good short story is harder than it is to to write a novel. Um, a short story, by the by its very definition, puts limits on the amount of words that you can cram into it. So every word that you put down as a, as a writer of a short story has got to mean something. It's got to count for something, and. Uh, Writing a good one is 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 hard to do. A novel gives a writer room uh, to spread out and be be sloppy and use words that they don't really need and, and sentences that they don't really need. That you know, as a uh, short story author, you really don't have that luxury. So, um, and I think as a horror writer, also the other piece of that in, in terms of short fiction is that short fiction whether it's a short story or uh, a shorter novel, like a novelette or a novella, um, the, kind of a perfect length for a horror story because maintaining that, that feeling of, of dread or, or fear is harder to do the longer the piece becomes. So when you've got a short story or a novella, novella and novelettes are really uh, almost as... as one of my favorites as a as a short story is, but it's it's just the perfect size to to maintain that that feeling that you're trying to go after as a horror author. So I think you know both sides of that coin that that uh, it takes a little bit more craft, I think, to write a good short story. But it also mm. the length of it uh, is easier to maintain that that you know horror feeling that you're you're trying to go for. 
Well, what makes a good horror? Like, what is it that you look for when you're doing a horror or if you, if you read a horror story? I think that, you know, and this is going to sound weird, but uh, re- realness, the realness of it. Uh, it, it. No matter how far out you go as a horror writer, um, the fear of it, the, 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 the thing that's going to amp your reader up, has got to come across as real. So you got to figure out a way as a as a horror author to yes put something into the into the book into the story that is going to you know ratchet your readers up and get them scared. But you've got to do it in a way. You've got to communicate that to the reader in a way that seems uh, relatable and something that seems very real about it. It's got to be grounded in that the reality of fear. Do you do you go for um, more of a suspense horror, or more of what could happen, a fear, or is it more about the uh, blood and guts? Well, I, I probably tend to fall down mostly on the side of that that more quiet horror, the sort of you know creeping dread that kind of builds as the story progresses. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, that doesn't say that I don't see the value of blood and gore and all that kind of stuff, too. It's part of horror, just as, you know, that quiet kind of existential horror is. Yeah, you know, one thing I, I uh, you know, we were talking earlier, we always talk about different shows, movies, mm-hmm. things like that. One thing that really bothers me of late on on horror is the amount of time that the author or writer, I guess I should say, uh, spends on 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 relationship and romance and mm-hmm. and all of this stuff uh, that um, it really it really kind of I lose interest in a lot of this. Well, I think that you know I think particularly nowadays uh, there's this uh, sort of drive that a lot of authors have, and I'm not I'm not pointing fingers or picking at it even, but the, this drive to, to sort of squash genres together. So you have genres that have overtones of, of romance or overtones of, of crime fiction, noir fiction, or whatnot. And I think that depending upon what the other genres is that the genres are that the authors are trying to, to squash into horror, yeah, there might be some focus on things that, you know, maybe if you're you're reading something just for the pure experience of horror, uh, you may not get. Uh, but you know, I think that I think it all has to come down on the side of of uh, being as real as possible. And you know, if you've got characters in your book that you know have some sort of a romance, yeah, you, you probably need to have a little bit of that in there. Uh, you know, it's. I think that the best horror tends to be character driven. So, um, if you're going to do horrible things to a character in a book, um, you better make the reader care about that character, you know, whatever it takes. If it's giving them a romantic relationship or talking about their childhood or whatever it is, the more you can humanize the character that you're going to ultimately put through a lot of, uh, crap. Uh, the better off I think the story resonates with readers. Yeah, but, you know, that's sort of what I, 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 I'm sort of, I I get that, but I don't know why, like, you know, you can watch, like, uh, Psycho, and you've got enough of each character, and kind of, you kind of know who they are, and you get a feeling for each, Mm -hmm. without it going overboard. I, I mean, I just notice a lot lately that, it's it's almost too much. It's it's way too detailed. There's too much information, and well, if anything, some of them are. I'm getting tired of some of the characters. Well, I think you know it's like anything else. The pendulum swings both ways, and probably before it corrects, it it overswings. And I think horror for a long time, especially in horror movies and and horror television, you know, the criticism was that you you, you know these characters were just cardboard cutouts. Uh, you know, these things were happening to these, these people, but it was hard to care about them because they were really just, you know, cardboard cutouts of, of actual people. So I think, yeah, maybe the, the pendulum has swung a little bit too far into the, 
you know, everybody has to have a character with a 12 page backstory. Um, and that the, uh, you know, the sweet spot is, is as it usually is somewhere in between. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, I just, that's just what I noticed, but I'm an amateur. So don't, nobody oh, listen to me. <laughs> I think you're probably right. And I think that, you know, I think, like I said, I think that that comes from the dual, you know, uh, view of horror as being more blood and guts and people trying to just, you know, get a little bit away from that. And, the, you know, one of the ways of doing that is, you know, expanding the characters um, in all sorts of directions. And, you know, some of that is useful and some of that's not. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's not knowing what what to choose for people to, to know about the character. Sometimes right. it's, you know, because, you know, if you go through Frankenstein, you go through some of the old classics, uh, it, it's just the the way the words are used. The description is all you need to feel that character. So that that's sort of the difference. Rather than uh, it's almost like a setup, and you can kind of guess what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that you know, I think especially among new writers, uh, it it's hard to it's hard to communicate that at some point you have to trust the reader to fill in the blanks, and you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to paint a picture. It's sort of like, you know, it's like that whole new writer trap of, you know, a character walks into a room and the author needs uh, feels the need to describe every flipping thing in the room, you know, every color, the couch material yeah. and yeah. the stuff on the wall. And it's like, you don't need to do that. You just need to give the reader enough to go on to fill in the details, and they'll do that. And that's, I think, what makes... The best books, horror or not, is when the author trusts the reader to be able to um, fill in the details. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. But, uh, you know, again, who am I? Um, <laughs> you know, so, so come on, tell us who does these things that are bad. Come on, <laughs> give us some names. Give us some names. Tell theirs. You want the dirt? Yeah, um, I want the dirt. Tell me the dirt. We won't tell anybody. How's that? We'll need a whole nother show. <laughs> Well, what do you what, what, so, well, what do you think of the of, of the horror world right now in 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 everywhere from movies to the streaming services to books and writers and stuff like you're you're in the middle of it. So what, yeah. what's your what's your feeling right now about it? I think that uh, horror as a, as a genre, both in in terms of the writing and in terms of uh, other media like uh, you know movies and TV and even games. I think it's really going through a golden a golden age. Um, if you go back 10 or so years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, most of the big publishers had walked completely away from horror. Um, you had your, you know, your Stephen King and your Clyde Barker and your Anne Rice and Peter Straub and people like that. But, you know, for the most part, they weren't looking for new writers. They weren't looking for new horror writers. They kind of let it go and it, and it, most of the, the imprints of the bigger houses uh, that published for had kind of quietly, or actually in some cases not so quietly, had gone out, of, you know, gone out of business or just given up the ghost, so to speak. But what happened was it was kind of unusual. It really hasn't happened as much in the other genres. Is that this huge over the years? This huge independent uh, press built up. Uh, that has really kind of shouldered uh, the horror movement over the last 10, you know, 5, 10 years. Uh, these, uh, lots of these independent presses like Grey Matter, who's uh, the press that has published a lot of my stuff. Um, you've got uh, Crystal Lake, and, and there's actually a lot of them, but they really shoulder the burden of bringing new horror writers to the front and giving readers... Um, access to a whole lot of authors and a whole lot of really good horror books that they otherwise, uh, because of you know the vicissitudes of the market, wouldn't have been exposed to. Um, so I think that because of that, we've got this huge community of really good horror authors out there. Um, you know, you've got the you know you've still got the top. 
uh, people like uh, Josh Mailerman and Stephen Grant Jones and Amakatsu and people like that. But then you have floating around in the indie press, you have a whole lot of others like uh, Phil Fricasi and Todd Kiesling, uh, Christy Demeester, uh, John Langan. Um, and I could go on for, you know, a couple of hours and just name names, but it really is, I think, um, since I've been doing this for about 30 years, it really is this explosion of, of talent. And, you know, surprisingly good. I think a lot of people think, well, it's the indie press, so there's probably, yeah, there may have been an explosion of authors, but probably most of them are horrible. Um, then that's not the case. Uh, I think the publishers have gotten uh, savvy about what it takes to bring a book to market and what, the, you know, what responsibilities the author and the publisher have to the reader in, in terms of, you know, giving you a book that looks nice and a book that is edited so there are mm. not 15 typos <laughs> in the first two pages. Um, and those were some hard lessons. And I think uh, a lot of uh, authors and publishing houses, small these small ind- independent houses, kind of, you know, went under, uh, not just for financial reasons, because it is an expensive mm. game to play, but also because, you know, they didn't edit their authors very well or they didn't present books in a very professional manner. But nowadays, it, you know, it, it, there's just a lot of people out there doing it and a lot of publishers out there doing it, and they're doing a you know, really, really good job. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of great stuff out there today. Yeah. But, you know, I, I was reading through, um, you know, uh, some of your work, and it feels like, you know, just to go back to, uh, it, it's, it feels like you were influenced a lot by, like, 1980s horror, like I was. And uh, is that correct? And um, do you have memories of, of, of the horror scene at that time? As you, I, uh, I started writing, uh, I started writing seriously in the, like, 90, 1990. Hmm. Uh, I was a big reader. I've always been a big reader, even when I was a kid. And, you know, I kind of uh, taken the route uh, through comics. I, you know, started reading comics. Hmm. And that got me into science fiction. I read science fiction for a long time. And then that got me into fantasy. And I read fantasy for a long mm. time. And then from there, I, I got into horror. It's not that I hadn't read horror before then, but I, I kind of really got into it as a genre. And it was about that time that I also started thinking about, you know, maybe I would like to try my hand at writing, too. So, you know, I don't know if it was a uh, because of a lifelong love of horror or it just hit me at the right time when I started thinking about writing. But, you know, I'm really influenced by Poe. He was really the first one uh, mm-hmm. that I read a lot of. Uh, Bradbury, uh, you know, King. I think it's inescapable to write for <laughs> these days as an American and not, you know, not be influenced on some level by King. Uh, but I, I would say of, 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 of an author at the same level around the same time, uh, I would offer Peter Straub, and Peter Straub really has been yeah. more, I think, a, more of an influence on me and my writing uh, than King has. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, you know, one of the 80s authors I think of all the time is Ray Garden. Um, yes. And Live Girls and a few of his other mm-hmm. books that, you know, weirdly are probably more blood and guts than a lot of the people <laughs> I read. But I really, you know... He's one of the ones that stands out for me, particularly in the 80s. Um, but, you know, over the last 30 years, I've, I've read, uh, read a lot of horror. Uh, and, you know, like I said, just over the last couple of years, two, three, four years, I, it's like the whole, it's like been a, you know, the high tide raises all boats or whatnot. But, you know, it just seems like a lot of, uh, a, there are a lot more authors doing a lot better than I think at, at, at any other time that I'm aware of. Hmm. And Stephen King, I've never heard of him, so I should look him up. <laughs> Who's that? Well, he's I this should... guy from me, you know. <laughs> so maybe I should look him up if <laughs> I want to find out something about horror, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I just... You know, and I, uh, here's the thing, uh, especially with uh, King, you know, people are so quick to poo-poo him or whatnot, but um, he's a good writer. You know, he's written yeah. bad books. Um, and I think if you'd have written, 
as many books as he had, you'd probably, you know, put out a clunker every once in a while. But he's an amazingly good writer. And I think it's just, I think it's fashionable in some circles to kind of, you know, hold your nose up at him or, or whatnot. But he's a very good writer. Yeah. He yeah. doesn't need me telling him that. Well, I'm <laughs> sure he feels better now. <laughs> <laughs> he's an easy but, target. And I'm all about that. Make well, there's feel better. Well, of course, you know he's he's a little political, and that always causes trouble these days. Sure, sure. Well, it seems like you can't yeah. you can't actually be a real person these days in the culture without offending someone. What else do you live for? <laughs> <laughs> Get out there and do it. Exactly. Now, speaking of offensive, <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that transition. Yeah, you've got <laughs> this book, the bad book. Okay, and and uh, I'm fascinated with this uh, now because I, now that I know what it is. So you've taken a good book as they used to call it. Right, right. That's where we got it from. The uh, the Holy Bible. The uh, Abraham Christian Bible. Now you've taken stories from that and you've turned them into horrors. I, I was going to say a lot of those stories probably are horror to begin well, with. Well, you know, one of the things I heard uh, you know, when I first started approaching authors uh to invite them into the book, I heard really one of two things. Uh, one was, wow, I, I have no desire to do that because I don't want to be struck by lightning. Um, <laughs> but the other one was, you know, aren't the, aren't a lot of stories in the Bible horrible enough as it is? You know, why do I, I'm not sure I could sit down and pen anything, you know, worse than some of the stories in the Bible. So, um, you know, luckily I got 13 uh, authors to accept the invitation and, and turn in some stories that were really good. And they're not, you know, I think uh, when I first started pitching the idea to publishers to pick up the book, um, I think they thought it was going to be a whole lot more uh, slamming Christianity or slamming uh, faith or, or that kind of stuff. But that's really not, that wasn't my intention to put the book together and it certainly wasn't uh, the kind of stories I got ultimately it was you know tweaking things like uh, you know the good Samaritan story what was what would happen if you know that wasn't a you know wasn't a good Samaritan it was a bad Samaritan but that's not actually one of the stories but sort of along the lines of, of what people did was they took a, a story and then just you know skewed it just slightly um, and I was real pleased with it and, and I think that uh, if, if people approach the book in the right way, I think they'll be pleasantly surprised. Well, I, I, I mean, your intention might not be to um, to slam Christianity, let's right. say. But it, I think the stronger the believer, the more of the thought that that's what it is. You know? Yeah. Because I, I get that. I mean, I touched off, I did a cult book. And in in there, I talked a lot about, you know, the reference to, to being a Christian and, and what right. it was like for me as a kid. Mm -hmm. And 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 um, I got attacked quite a bit. And my idea, actually, the concept for me was that I was kind of putting Charles Manson in the place of Jesus Christ. Ah. And, and it's not that I was saying he was, but, I mean, in, right. in essence, if you took someone like Charles Manson in today's world – you know, the long hair wearing a robe walking around telling you that he's God's mm. son and you need to do what he tells you and all this stuff, we would think, what's this nutball here? Right. So, right. so my, my, my idea was just really look at the times. It's something that could have only happened at that time, mm -hmm. not now. And uh, people took that as uh, very, um, you know, they, they, didn't, they weren't happy. <laughs> yeah, I think that... <laughs> You know, I think you're right. I think there, I'm, I'm sure there will be people who take a poke at the book or take a poke at, uh, poke at, you know, individual stories inside the book. But, you know, I guess my, my feeling, uh, about that has always been, you know, wow, if, uh, a story in a book is going to undermine your faith in a story in another book, I'm not sure mm -hmm. your faith is that strong to begin with. Well, as an editor, how do you pick your stories? Uh, what are you looking for? You know, I, it's funny because these are the these two books uh, that I've well, you know, got this bad book out now, and I've got 
uh, a book called Dark Stars, which was an, an anthology that I've done for tour. It'll be out in March. The, the first two books that I've actually actively, you know, put together and edited. Um, and so it was weird for me as an author to approach it because, you know, my feeling about uh, someone else's work is sort of like, you know, uh, this is this is the choice that they made. So this is the story, and this you know the author wrote it this way. This is what it is. But as an editor, you can't sit, you can't sit down and think that way. You've got to you've got to read the story. You've got to see what the author is trying to do, and then you've got to make decisions uh, that hopefully will uh, make what the author is trying to do more clear or more resonant or whatever. So, um, but to get there, I think. I, as an editor, there was, there had to be something about the story that grabbed me. Um, so, you know, cause I, I thought if the story doesn't grab me somehow, I don't think that, uh, all the editing in the world is going to probably help, uh, an author get there. And certainly I don't look at myself as some, you know, Ellen Datlow level air, uh, mm-hmm. editor. So, uh, you know, it always had to be that the stories had to grab me somehow on some level and if if that was uh a level that that i thought well the store grabs me but i think it needs to do xyz or it doesn't need to do xyz then i thought well i can work with that then that's the kind of story i could work with and that's the kind of story that that i would want to have in the book um because i think that as uh, as the editor of a book you've got to look at it as if you are the reader and Hmm. Um, you've got to help that author communicate in the best possible way to get their point. Because every story has a point. Uh, and you want to make sure that that point gets across. I think that, uh, you know, I've always kind of looked at horror, uh, in, in a weird way, which is almost like, it's almost like comedy that, that you have to get it. You know, when the story is mm-hmm. over, you have to get it just as you would a, a, a joke or a comedy routine. And if you don't get it, well, then the story, you know, from a horror sense, then the story is just kind of lost on you. So, uh, you know, my my hope was that I would be able to help any author who I brought into one of these anthologies to make sure that the reader got their story. Um, so... I hope I was able to do that. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, well, how can you really tell? Yeah. You know, you I mean. But I think that, you know, after 30 years, I've, I've gotten a pretty good, uh, I think I have a pretty good ear, as it were, for for what works and what doesn't in a, in a horror story. So I'm pretty confident. I've got um, 13 stories in the bad book and 12 stories in dark stars. And I think they're all phenomenal. And I, and I, you know, we've already had, well, the bad book is out in the wild right now, so you can go get it. Dark stars has been, uh, sent out in, uh, review form to a lot of, uh, reviewers and, and, uh, other authors to see what they think to get blurbs as they say. Um, and we've gotten good feedback on both of them. So, I, I, you know, I think that both books are going to resonate well with people. Well, you know, um, do you look for some sort of a, an angle? Like, do you, like, are you hoping, uh, how do I say this? Are you hoping that there is some sort of meaning people get out of your stories besides the horror? I think that, you know, for me, horror is, what, what sets horror apart from any, any other genre, um, every other genre, with the possible exception of romance, is that horror is based on an emotion. You know, science fiction is not based on an emotion. Fantasy is not based on an emotion. A Western is not based on emotion. Horror is based on an emotion. And one of the things that I have found in my own writing and and also my own reading over the last 30 years is that horror works best as an emotion when it's coupled with some other emotion. So if you just have a horror story, there's nothing going on 
in that story, but the horror, it's it, to me, it doesn't resonate as well as it would if there was something else going on. If you, if there was a uh, love, uh, love story, maybe not too much, like you said, but some sort of a love angle or a lust angle or, or even comedy added with horror, it can work really, really well. But I think when horror is just by itself, it works, but it doesn't work as well as it does uh, when it's coupled with some other emotion. Um, so what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for in a story is is some uh, somehow how that story is going to engage with me as a reader on a level that's not just horror. So if there's uh, grief involved, so it's a sad horror story, or uh, you know something like that. So so it's going to engage not just oh my god this is terrifying and I you know want to pull my toes in from under the covers, um, but you know some other emotion that you can you can play off that. Um, and to me, I've always said that it, it sort of works. Um, like salted caramel, that that the addition of the salt somehow makes the sweet taste sweeter. Um, mm-hmm. That some other emotion, when it's coupled with horror, kind of makes the horror worse. Um, so I'm kind of looking for that. I'm kind of looking for some emotional resonance in the story. That's what usually uh, gets me. Hmm. Do, do, do you take stories from just anybody? Just can anybody send in their story to you? You know, I, uh, you know, I wish, I wish you could do that. What happens is, and I've, uh, you know, I've watched off uh, publishing houses. You know, like say Gray Matter, uh, who I've worked for, you know, for the last seven, eight, nine years, something like that. Uh, and uh, the publisher there, Tony Rivera, has has done what you call open calls, which is, you know, you just announce you're having a an anthology, you tell people what the theme is, and then you just say, send your story in. Um, and what happens uh, when you do that is you get, like, I think the, uh, the last anthology that Tony did did that with, he got, he had like, a thousand mm-hmm. submissions. I, I don't have time or the patience to read it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, it's too much, too much. Uh, so I tend to, what I tend to do is, uh, well, certainly for these last uh, two that I just did, um, I think of the people that I'd like to work with. It's, it's really that simple. I think of the people that I'd like to work with, and then I invite them. Um, you know, sometimes they get turned down. Most of the times I, you know, they they take it and we go from there. Uh, but, you know, I wish I could, I wish I had the time to offer open submissions because that's where you find new voices. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's harder to find a new voice when you're basically just inviting people that are already out there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, and new ideas, you know, like right. someone, someone give you an idea that you just, Totally out of the blue, you know, like a writer trapped in pandemic with three <laughs> dogs that, uh, you know. Nobody believed that. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> That's not real. Yeah. And then you can add this little scratch and sniff to the cover. and. But, I, uh, you know, I, I, I keep my uh, eyes out for uh, new people or people that – uh, haven't been that familiar with me or people who are just getting started and, and if they look like they've got a, you know, a pretty good take on, uh, you know, especially for the anthologies for, for short fiction, I'll take a chance. I'll take a chance on somebody and invite them and uh, hopefully they'll get a little bit more of an audience to, so they can build a readership for their own stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty aware of that. You know, you you put it together an anthology. And you do have to have, you know, you do have to have some names in there to carry the thing, to sell the thing. Um, but you also, you know, I'm very aware of the responsibility you sort of have to to bring new voices out. Um, and it's fun. It's fun to just, you know, uh, get a story from someone who who perhaps is not as well known. Uh, but this blows you away when you get it. You're like, wow, that's fantastic. I'm so glad I, I invited them. Well, I was wondering, um, 
How did the Dark Stars anthology come about? Uh, is there a story behind that? Yeah, there is. Um, I uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna name drop here. I am, <laughs> I'm friends with Josh Mailerman. And, uh, Red Box, yeah. yeah, we had been talking, uh, you know, about three years ago, two, three years ago about things that we could work together on. And, uh, one of the, uh, formative, uh, anthologies that I read back in the eighties was called Dark Forces. Um, mm-hmm. it was edited by Kirby McCauley, who was a, a famous agent at the time. Uh, and, it was a basically just a bringing together. I think they were trying to, he was trying to show that uh, horror is kind of, it can be literary. Um, and he, so he brought together people like uh, Joyce Carol Oates and Isaac Bashman mm-hmm. Singer and, and, you know, people like that who you normally wouldn't think of, at least at the time, as, uh, you know, writing a horror story. Um, so uh, it, it was kind of a really, uh, seminal anthology for horror, and it was a big one for me. Um, so when Josh and I were talking, I said, you know, no one has really, in the 40 years uh, that has passed between the publication of Dark Forces, nobody's really done a, a follow-up to that. Why don't we, why don't we do a follow-up to it? So, uh, so we kind of, I kind of approached some authors and, and got some uh, buy-ins, uh, from them, and then, you know, it just takes a while to kind of wind its way through, and I finally got hooked up with the people at Tor. Um, they have a new uh, imprint called Nightfire, which is uh, horror books, and uh, they like the idea, so uh, I think I had about half of the table of contents filled when I approached Tor, um, and then I filled... They were like, yeah, this is great, but we want you to fill the rest of the TOC and, and show us what you got. So I was able to fill, it took me like a year and a half to fill the first half of the TOC. It literally took me a day to, f- <laughs> to fill the rest of the TOC because now I, it's like, well, not only do I have these authors who are going to be in it, but now I actually have a real publisher that's going to publish it. So, hmm. so uh, yeah, it's sort of the... Uh, uh, follow-up to Dark Forces, um, designed not really to show that, that uh, horror is literary, because I think that, that that question has been settled. But this is really mm-hmm. to show kind of the, uh, the breadth that horror has. I still think that horror is one of the uh, genres that is the most, is the widest. I mean, mm-hmm. there's so much that can fit within the, the confines of, of what horror is. You, you know, you've got the, the blood and guts horror, you've got literary horror, you've got uh, cosmic horror, you've got suspense kind of horror, you've got psychological horror, uh, dark fantasy kind of horror. And so I wanted to kind of bring together a group of writers who are really at the top of their game and show readers what exists out there right now that, uh, uh, that forms what horror is today. Um, I think we did a pretty good job. I mean, we've got, uh, uh, one of the nice things about it was, uh, I was trying to look for connective tissue between dark forces and dark stars. And I, and Ramsey Campbell, who, uh, is, you know, one of the, the, you know, absolute mm-hmm. masters of horror, uh, he had a short story in dark forces. So I thought, well, it'd be cool to, see if he would write the uh, the afterword uh, for Dark Stars. So I approached him, and uh, he is a uh, wonderful, wonderful gentleman uh, who said, of course, I'll be happy to give you an afterword, but how would you feel also about a, a, a piece of new fiction, which I hadn't wow. thought about at all just because I didn't think it was likely. Um, so I was like, yeah, a piece of new fiction <laughs> for you to be in the book too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he's got a, a story in. we've got stories from people like, well, Josh is in it. Um, Caroline Kepneys, who I, you know, I don't know if people think of her as a horror writer, but I think some of the stuff she does fits very well in there. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones, uh, mm-hmm. Amakatsu, yeah. uh, John Langan, I've got a story in there. 
Um, so it's a, it's, it's quite the gamut of, of stories. Uh, I'm anxious to get it out there. <laughs> I'm a cat. So we, uh, we interviewed, I, I didn't even know who she was. Ah, she's great. She's yeah. great. Yeah. Very, very nice. I was just, I was surprised at how popular she was. when I. <laughs> yeah. It's that, you know, the, the, uh, I like what she does with taking, you know, real historical events, mm. uh, and putting a horror spin on them. What was your point? Like when you did the bad book, I I, I want to beat this mm-hmm. one. Uh, but, <laughs> like what like what what were you thinking when you were putting it together? Like what was like where did this come from? What what made you kind of go? I know what I want to do. Like where was that from? You know, to be honest with you, it was. Yeah, there's no. You know, I don't have a really glib answer for that. It was. Um, I wanted to do. I I, I sort of got the taste for putting together Dark Stars. So I wanted to be able to do another anthology. Um, And uh, it was more of a, you know, looking out at what was being done because uh, one of the things that there is a glut of right now in horror is anthologies. Um, So I wanted to make sure whatever else I did beyond Dark Stars would be something that wasn't, you know, hadn't already been covered as a theme uh, you know, or hadn't been just done to death over the last, you know, decade or so. So, uh, yeah, I just thought Bible stories would be interesting. I mean, I was, uh, raised Catholic. I'm not religious anymore at all. I'm really more of an agnostic. Uh, but I've, yeah, I've got an interest in all sorts of religions and mythology and that sort of thing. So I just thought, uh, you know, it wasn't something that, that had been done, uh, at least recently. And, uh, it seemed to offer a fertile, you know, when you, when you go to authors, uh, for an anthology and you give them a theme, you know, the danger is that you're going to give them a theme that is so narrow that it's just hard for, it's either hard for the author to think of something to do. Or it's hard for you as an editor because your theme is so narrow, you're going to get 12 stories that are basically the same thing. Um, So I wanted to make sure that it was something uh, wide enough to give authors plenty of of room to write in, but also, you know, that I wasn't likely to get, uh, you know, 12, 13 stories that were basically the same story. Um, And that's just the one that actually just kind of stuck in my my craw at the time. So, uh, I did almost back away from it just because, yeah. uh, you know, like I said, the response I got at the beginning was so, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, Ooh, Ooh, wow. I, I, <laughs> I don't really know that I can do that. I, uh, yeah, I don't want to be struck. I don't want God to strike me down with lightning. So, um, <laughs> so it was hard. And I, you know, I had some discussions with, some other people in the industry, uh, and actually Doug Morano, who's the editor of uh, uh, two big anthologies, uh, gut, well, he's been the editor of a bunch of them, Gutted and uh, Behold, and his latest is called Miscreations, which is up for the Shirley Jackson Award. Um, you know, I said, I, I think I've got to, I think I've got to tone it down if I'm going to get offers into this thing. And he's like, no, 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 don't tone it down. Lean into it. You know, hmm. that's really what you need to do. You need to lean into it. And I did. And, you know, like I said, I, I was able to get 13 really great stories. Well, you know, and when you mentioned the awards, like, so do the awards and do the um, groups – that mm-hmm. form together, or do they really matter? Are they important? Like, what what's your take on on the different areas and stuff? Like, I, said, I you know, I see a lot about Bram Stoker. I always call him, but <laughs> but the Stroker Awards and stuff, and the nominees and stuff, and you've had some of those. So I'm just thinking, is that kind of a goal, or is that is that kind of a standard that you? everybody in the horror industry wants to accomplish? Like, what, I mean, I, you know, I can't certainly can't speak for everybody in the horror industry. I, it's not a goal. I don't, I don't ever sit down and write something and think this is going to win an award. I know, <laughs> know for sure. Uh, because I think you're crazy if you do that. And I think you're probably going to be wrong 
99.9% of the time. Um, it, you, know, I, you know, awards are nice. Um, I don't, um, I don't put a whole lot into it. I, I did at the beginning. Um, uh, but I, you know, it just seems like, uh, if you're destined to win an award, you're going to win the award, uh, regardless of how much or how little effort you put into getting into people's hands or whatnot. So they're nice. And, you know, I, I'd certainly, I take more, um, but, uh, it's not a driving, it, you know, it's not a driving force with me. Um, and I think that organizations like uh, the Horror Writers Association in the horror industry and almost every genre has its own. You know, to me, the importance of those organizations is really um, social. You know, I, I, my career really didn't start to really take off until about 10 years ago when I, uh, attended my first, uh, StokerCon. That actually wasn't just StokerCon at the time, it was the World Horror Convention in, uh, New Orleans. And, you know, I was able to meet people. I was able to put faces to names that I had known, but, you know, I hadn't really personally met. And I think that you, uh, you form friendships with people. You get to know them. Uh, they feel comfortable with inviting you to things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, and it sort of takes off from there. So I really look at, uh, going to things like StokerCon as a chance to, you know, put my face out there and get to meet people, uh, who I might not normally have the opportunity to meet. I think it's just a way of strengthening. It's like a professional thing. It's just a, mm-hmm. a way to strengthen, uh, your professional bonds with people and, and then that, that, parlays itself hopefully down the line into, you know, invitations and, you know, to participate in different pro- projects or getting to know people who can open a particular door for you, whether that's in, you know, movies or something like that. So it's important, but it's not vital. It's a good way to network. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all it is. I think, you know, I think if you look at it from that point of view, I think, <laughs> That you're being realistic, and mm-hmm. I think that uh, it becomes, you know, less of a, a, a chore or mm-hmm. something like that, and becomes just more of a, hey, I'm going to see my friends. Yeah, and you do make a lot of friends. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just in the last <laughs> ten years, uh, you know, I've made some people. You know, some people that I've met at 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 StokerCon or World Horror Convention or you know, people that I've um, sold stories to or whatnot uh, who I consider to be very good friends. You know, Anthony Rivera, Tony, mm-hmm. at Great Matter Press, is uh, I consider him to be a very close friend. Yeah, absolutely. Now, going back to um, your, your, uh, to your own work, mm-hmm. uh, do you uh, – I always like to ask this. Do you have an inner monologue? Can you hear your characters – um, can you hear the narration, oh, yeah. or is it more images, symbols, stuff like that? No, I, I really, you know, generally what unlocks a story for me, when I, you know, if I think of an idea, um, and then you think of another idea, and then you think of a way to put those two ideas together. But what really unlocks a story for me is who, the main character, finding the main character's voice, um, mm. and and having that voice speak in your head um Mm -hmm. that sort of unlocks the story for me so then once i get that figured out and i can hear that character talking then it becomes really easy because then it's almost just like you're transcribing uh you know you're just playing secretary to the voices in your head (laughs) Uh, and then it becomes not quite so daunting you just let that voice talk and you know some of what that voice uh, tells you is not going to be useful, but you know a lot of it. Once you get that voice, is gonna is gonna come through in the story, and it's really gonna make the story. Um, you know, I've I've like probably any writer, I've got a million ideas singing around in my head, but it's really not until I get the the voice of the main character sorted out that the ideas. Uh, you know, present themselves in such a way that, that it makes sense to write them down. 
See, Alan, not so crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, do these voices start telling you to do things, you know? Mm. Kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, they start and, telling you to light things on fire and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It goes too far. Yeah, yeah. Well, so how do you want people to get a hold of you? Do you have a website? Do you do social media? Yeah. Uh, Tinder, Grinder, like what's... <laughs> What's <laughs> we'll talk about the grinder thing online. <laughs> uh, you know, long ago I decided that, uh, you, you know, you probably have to do social media to survive these days, but I can only manage one. I, so I, I chose my poison, and my poison is Twitter. Um, so you can follow me. I'm pretty active on Twitter, and I'm pretty approachable. Um, it's just John F. E. Taff, at John F. E. Taff, so... Um, pretty active on Twitter. I'm, I don't do Facebook at all. Uh, I used to do Instagram, but it got to be too time consuming, so I got away from that. Uh, I have a blog that I seriously need to be more diligent about <laughs> updating and posting <laughs> things to. Um, and that's at johnftaft.com. Uh, but you know, I have an author's page too on Amazon. If you just go in and search for John F. Taft. Uh, it'll kind of pull up all my work. Uh, but the easiest way to get a hold of me is just to find me on Twitter and follow me there. Well, of course, we'll have that link to our page as well so people can find you. And, uh, yeah. you know, just text me. I'll give you even more information. You want a phone number? <laughs> like my grinder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. You know. I, yeah, your grinder name. <laughs> well, we'll tell you the truth. We'll tell you what. What the F D stands for <laughs> on Grinder. Uh, swipe left, so, swipe right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's bonus. <laughs> that's yeah. the bonus. That's <laughs> you have to you pay extra for that one. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. None of the nothing's for free anymore. Right? Jeez, you know. What's next for you? Like you're doing short stories and, and Yeah, I, got, um, I just finished a novel uh that is with my agent right now. It's called uh, plastic Space House. I know that just sounds like <laughs> three words that I grabbed at random. Um, but I am really excited. Uh, he's going to be putting that out for sale uh, very soon here. Um, it's a lot different than, than than my previous stuff. But, yeah, I'm also looking for, you know, I've got Dark Source coming out in March, but I'm also looking for, uh, a next anthology to edit. So I've been kind of keeping a brainstorming list going of themes and, and, uh, we'll see where that, uh, that heads up. And, you know, eventually, hopefully tour uh, is successful enough with the dark stars that we'll uh, do a follow up to that. Wow. Dark something. Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh boy, Jeez, that's, I'm not the one to say. My no, we'll just leave that there. We'll just leave that. You know, dark, dark. Yeah, blank. Uh, I'm terrible. Well, we certainly learned a lot. Boy, we learned a lot. You know, and I, I guess now I know. I definitely know I'm not supposed to show up to StrokerCon with uh, leather. <laughs> Oh, you'd be the belle of the ball if you showed no. up. No. Mm. Well, I just fe- I thought it was StrokerCon, so I showed up in a leather outfit, and then everyone's going, what are you? It's like, so I kind of felt out of place. Um, but now, now I know better. It's you know. Stoker. The more you know. Yeah, the more you know, the better it sounds, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Well, it's certainly been interesting, and um, I don't know. Well, like I said, I, I come away, I'm a better person, so... <laughs> That's uh, my goal. My goal of every interaction. That's right. I mean, <laughs> everything you could ask for, and more. <laughs> and more. And more. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it, and, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, people will go out there and grab uh, those books and yeah, and uh, be interested in them. And yeah, and of course, we've been talking about the bad book, and yes. and of course, the. Uh, Author is our guest, John F.D. Taff, which, of course, we'll tell you about that off air. For mm-hmm. our... <laughs> yeah, so it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure, and you guys uh, have a great day. Thanks, John. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed.
The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. I'll say it. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.